Every now and then, something will incite a debate about modesty in our culture. And this is an important thing because modesty is a good thing. And the reason we know that it's a good thing is because we all hate it when someone acts immodestly around us based on whatever standard of modesty we happen to uphold. We don't like it when others act arrogantly in proximity to ourselves. Nobody likes it when someone excessively boasts or brags or flagrantly tries to capture all the attention to be had for themselves, leaving none for the rest of us. Like for example, nobody likes the person who always has the one-up story. Do you know what I mean by that? Like the person who, when you're in a group of people and you tell a story that you think will be interesting to everybody else and then they jump in right afterwards with something like, oh yeah, well this one time I did something so much cooler than that. So I hope that we can all admit that modesty in, it, in its various forms is something that we can all appreciate as a good that helps society get along better. But what about modesty in the way that we present ourselves physically? and especially in how we dress. I think it's helpful if we approach this subject by appreciating the fact that there is a currency of exchange that takes place when we interact with each other in public. And that currency is knowledge. When we cross paths with other people in public, even strangers, they are acquiring knowledge about us to some degree. And that knowledge can be really superficial as an only visual where we see each other and then make assessments about each other. Or it can be something more detailed and nuanced as in we might have an economic exchange with someone else. And the thing about knowledge is it's a powerful thing. It gives other people a kind of power over you to whatever degree you give it to them, which makes you vulnerable. So for example, the first time you sit down with a financial advisor, he or she will gain intimate knowledge about you that could be used to hurt you or to help you, but you trust that they'll only use it to help you. You allow yourself to be vulnerable with that person because you feel that you can place a certain amount of trust in them. So when it comes to the way that clothing either reveals or conceals our physical form, our bodies, that too is a kind of knowledge that can hurt you because we are, by our broken, neurotic, fallen nature, insecure about a whole bunch of things, but especially about our bodies. That's why we spend so much time trying to improve our physical attractiveness by grooming ourselves, by washing ourselves, by combing and brushing and plucking, by trying on different outfits, by flexing in front of the mirror to make sure that, you know, we hold ourselves in the right kind of posture, by meticulously applying makeup, and by spraying ourselves with scents that do anything but reveal our natural aroma. And this is because when people have knowledge of your physical attributes, that makes you vulnerable. It's something that can be used against you or create a distraction or an impediment to what would otherwise be just a normal and rudimentary social exchange. People can make judgments or assessments about your body the more they know about it. And then they can make remarks about it to you or to other people, which is the kind of thing that can be so traumatic that you can carry it with you and allow it to influence future social interactions for the rest of your life. That is a powerful kind of influence that someone else can, can exert over you. So the more knowledge of your body about how attractive it is based on whatever standards you or they uphold, the more knowledge that you give other people, the more power they have over you. And this raises an important question, which I hope is obvious to you by now, which is, how much knowledge of ourselves should we give to strangers? Because that's what the question of modesty in dress ultimately means. Because how we dress in public translates into how much knowledge we give to strangers. And here's the thing about strangers, and I hate to break it to you, but they don't love you. I know. They, they don't have your best interests at heart. And that's why we only give certain people certain amounts of knowledge about ourselves. The more we trust certain people, the more we give them access to knowledge that makes us vulnerable. And that trust comes from the fact that they love us, that they care for us, and that they won't use that knowledge to hurt us. And strangers shouldn't be given the same privilege and access to knowledge about our lives that we give to people who have earned it because of the love that they have demonstrated for us. 
So it stands to reason that we should only give the majority of people that we interact with in this way in public very restricted access to this knowledge about ourselves. And this is what clothing can do. And practically speaking, this correlates to how revealing or concealing it is. The more revealing your clothing is, the more you are freely giving people knowledge about yourself that they haven't earned. Now, I'd be negligent if I didn't say something about how these principles should be applied selectively to men and women as distinct. And this is where things can get really hyper-emotional and sensitive. So can I just invite all of us to take a deep breath and exhale, and let's try to think about this logically. Because we all want men and women to be treated equally, but the problem is that we aren't equal in the sense that we are the same. We have different body types and different physical attributes, which means that clothing has to be applied differently, just pragmatically speaking. And we also approach social and physical intimacy differently. This was reaffirmed for me in dramatic fashion when I read recently about a study that was conducted quite a long time ago, but has been repeated several times and always came out with the same results, in which men and women were approached by a reasonably attractive solicitor who then invited them to a casual sexual encounter. Of the men surveyed, 75% of them were willing to go ahead with it. Of the women surveyed, 0% submitted and accepted the proposal. And I think one of the obvious reasons for this distinction is the amount of vulnerability that women have to tolerate in physical intimacy. Men are generally much more physically strong than women, so it takes a lot of trust or intoxication for women to be willing to put themselves in such a physically vulnerable position. Men, by contrast, don't have to fear this same vulnerability, which is also why men should show deference to women out of this principle and be willing to demonstrate love and commitment before they apply any kind of pressure like this on them. So I think it stands to reason that women, when it comes to physical vulnerability with respect to sex and modesty, are much more at risk of exploitation than men are. And because of this distinction, I think that this should inform how we think about and, and the conclusions that we draw about modesty in dress. Now, let me pause right here really quickly and enthusiastically say that I am not saying that certain kinds of clothing choices are sinful or that certain people should be admonished for their clothing choices, even if that's true. I'm not saying it because I'm no moral authority and because the moral authorities that I look to haven't defined, strictly speaking, any such standard. What I am trying to ascertain in this assessment is what kind of principles can be used to empower you in the kinds of decisions you make about how much knowledge you're going to give strangers and therefore how much power you're going to allow people to have over you. And let me jump back to what I said earlier about the equality of men and women, because I for one do want women to be just as comfortable as men when they go out in public. And based on the current societal pressures that we place on them, I don't think that that is the case at all. Like as a man, I can go out in public and not feel overly concerned or insecure about strangers assessing and judging my body because my clothing doesn't give much away. The acceptable and even the fashionable standards of men's clothing aren't that revealing or suggestive. Like this shirt doesn't give that much away. You can't tell if I have a six pack or a bit of a dad bod going on under here. My chest isn't on full display and yet, this shirt is a perfectly acceptable shirt based on the standards that are imposed on men. And some might even say it's, it's a somewhat fashionable shirt. But the standards we impose on women, by contrast, are incredibly revealing. Culturally, we act like opening the doors to allowing women to wear similar clothing items like pants to men was this great equalization between men and women. But women don't wear pants like men do, and they never have. My pants are again loose and, and fairly comfortable to wear, but the conventions for women's pants and jeans are that they hug every curve so tightly that it leaves nothing to the imagination. And frankly, there's nothing equal about that. And as a father of daughters, I don't think it's fair that they should be pressured by society to conform to such a one-sided and exploitative standard. 
So in acknowledging the distinctions between men and women, both in body type and in our approach to intimacy, what's the solution? Because I don't think most women want to be wearing what passes as men's fashion either. Women are by nature captivating and beautiful, and there's something in the essence of femininity that would be lost if they dressed exactly like men. So what kind of clothing choices for women would contribute to the same level of comfort that men enjoy without sacrificing their distinct femininity? I hope the answer to that question is obvious. And in fact, I hope it's so obvious that I don't even have to come out and say it because previous incarnations of culture came much closer to what I'm trying to describe. And we unfortunately jettisoned their wisdom and what was good and true about it in pursuit of an equality that never was and at this rate never will be. Thank you so much for watching that, you guys. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider subscribing and hitting that bell if you're on YouTube or just liking and following from wherever you are and wherever you happen to be watching this from. And if you want to support the making of these videos, then please consider supporting my work as a digital media and marketing expert. My company, Holdsworth Design, is a branding and communications company that specializes in web design and logo and branding, graphic design, uh, videography, and communications and marketing strategy. So if you know of a parish or a diocese or a business or a ministry that needs help in those areas, then please send them our way and I'm sure that we can probably help them out. And be sure to check out the website which is holdsworthdesign.com.